something has happened over time. But it's almost like the authenticity of the gospel of Jesus Christ has severely been usurped by men's definitions and their ways of doing things, by a bunch of philosophers and all these kings that set themselves up in history that turned Christianity into a government that was cruel unto the people. And it's almost like the truth has been washed over and the importance of the gospel of Jesus Christ is still there by way of words, but by way of deeds, there are some things missing. That's why he sent you here. That's why you're not the average individual. That's why you don't believe like everybody else and it's not passive to you. What if I were to tell you that we have missed it? And when you miss it like that, the power is not there. And how many people have gone out there and think you got beat up? See, we have to cover this. Listen to me. You are authorized to go out to speak, not only to speak. Listen, there's a difference between men speaking and a spirit-filled person speaking. There's a huge difference. And I'll tell you right now, too many people are speaking by their own voice. You're not here to tell what you have to say. That's not what you're here for. You're ambassadors to Christ. An ambassador does not carry his or her own word, own message. They don't carry anything in themselves. They're just a vessel, an appointed vessel. That's what an ambassador is. They carry a message for the one in the kingship, the one that's the top Dog. That's what they do. They carry it everywhere to anybody they're sent. But it's not their message. Because see, if something were to happen to that ambassador, it's not by the ambassador's weapons he's going to be free. How many people have you heard? They said, well, this can't be literal. This has to be figuratively speaking. You know why they say that? Because it's not working for them. And when it's not working for them, they start changing things. They'll say, I did everything and it doesn't work for me. That's what they say. And so they teach other people, well, don't think of it that way. Think of it the lesser way, right? Don't think of it the lesser way. And don't try to be like those in the world. See, there's something wrong in the world right now. There's a very low standard when it comes to faith. And people have what I call hush-hush faith. You know what that means? You know, it's okay for you to believe in the Word of God and everything else, but don't go out there putting hands on somebody in the middle of a big crowd thinking that somehow they're going to be healed. Don't do that. Fear is a spirit. That's why in the Bible it says God did not give us a spirit of fear. So let me give you the spiritual side of what happens with that. When you get one of these letters and fear enters into you, fear begins to talk to you and your thoughts change. Those thoughts that you have, they contaminate any pure thing that would ever come out of you. You can't speak the word of God with fear involved because what you'll say is going to be tainted. There are so many times when I've heard people who were not in a fearful situation, they would talk about the Lord and the message was good and positive and encouraging. That same individual, in moments of crisis, they begin to talk about how you have to always protect yourself. It never fails. It happens that way for a reason. They tell you about, you know, you got to watch your friends because they'll betray you. You got to watch this and watch that and watch that over there and watch everything else. In other words, the word that they have within them, they're kind of let down, number one, because of that situation. Number two, they're unsure if anything is going to be taken care of because it really challenges your faith in that moment. And number three, because they're not sure who they can trust, when they start to tell anything in the word, is tainted by fear itself. And if it's tainted by fear, it's no longer God's word. In fact, if God gave us a sentence to say and we change one letter, it's no longer the message of the living God. That's why in Revelation it says, do not change anything. Don't take away from it. Don't add to it. Don't add your two cents to it. Don't take away the two cents from it. Anything you take away is going to be taken away from your portion. And if you add something to it, so will the plagues be added unto you in proportion of what you added to Revelation. So God is serious about us not changing his message. Now, suppose he didn't remove iniquity away from any of the prophets. They would have carried God's word. And it would have been tainted. And it wouldn't have been God's word. It would have been their word. Does God have to watch over our word to perform it? Will God perform what we say? No, he will not. I'm going to go ahead and say no, he won't. Because we, our words are flawed. His word is not. This is his creation. This is his world. These are his molecules, atoms. These are his principles, right? His, his laws of physics and everything else. If the word can be tainted because of our flesh, because of fear, because of how we see things, because of what we learn, if it can be changed so easily, especially because of fear. I've seen people have one message, and because of fear, they did not deliver the message exactly as it was given because they were frightened of their lives. I've seen that when men delivered 
messages to other countries. They didn't want to deliver that message because they thought that possibly if they delivered it just as they received it, they would be killed for it. Conflicts have started because of these things. When God gives this word, it must be untainted, but it also must be in a vessel that will keep the integrity of that word. Because if it's not, it's not God's word. And if it's not God's word, and somebody gives a word as though God did give it, then when you start to read the book of Ezekiel, you find out God is against everybody who does that, who speaks out of their own spirit. See, God sent a message to the ones who were doing that too. He said that they would say, thus saith the Lord. And he said, I have not spoken to you, but these are men speaking out of their own spirit. And he's going to deal with him. And it's not going to be good when he deals with him. So first of all, God does not want you to be condemned at all. But those people who spoke out of their own spirits, who spoke what they wanted to speak and said, God gave this, they're in big trouble. Oh, they're in big trouble. These are the people who assumed a position and ran out there trying to give God's word. And God did not anoint them in any way to do it. He didn't empower them. And so the word was tainted. And they spoke out of their own spirits. And they did it for many years. And God ultimately said they did it to fill their barns up. They did it to get rich. They did it to continue to have stuff. That's why they did it. And when they did it for so long, they couldn't see it anymore. They couldn't see it was wrong. And they passed that over to another generation who then spoke the words of men as though they were words of God. Then it was all messed up. And then God had to undo the whole thing. Because once something gets embedded in the spirit of mankind, it's very difficult to get rid of. That's why when God gave Jeremiah his word and caused his iniquity to pass from him, they did not want to hear it. The priests didn't want to hear it. The, all the preachers, and they didn't want to hear it. It's strange how that God would give his word to tell to the pastors, to give to the high priests, and all this other stuff. And these guys were building up false fortifications. God was very direct. He said all they were doing was speaking peace. And you know what God said? God said, I have spoken no peace, but they have weakened my peace people by speaking peace, saying that I spoke peace. I never gave that to them. Isn't that something? That's what the world looks for, peace and safety. That's not what we strive for. We strive for kingdom principles. We strive to be obedient. We strive to give praise and to lift up the name of the Lord because of the truth we know of him. But they did it the wrong. They do it much like people do today. Promising peace and there is going to be no peace. Promising relaxation and God never spoke anything about relaxation. In fact, he said that rest is to be within Christ and that is the place of rest. So you see what happens when men see things, when fear steps in, when ambition steps in and it alters the word of God. That's not in the realm of tangibility. That's in the spiritual realm. That's precisely what Satan wants. That's precisely what's happening today on a very large scale. A lot of people ask, how come we don't have miracles like they did in days of old? Why does it seem that God's word is so challenged? Let me ask you guys this. If somebody cast out a demon, anybody answer this. Why would anybody have to say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus more than one time? Do demons have miracle ears? Will they lose their batteries? Do they wear hearing aids? What's going on? They can't hear it the first time? Something wrong with that? Something is wrong with that. I thought about that when I was a kid. I remember asking my mother, I said, why would anybody have to tell any demons something twice? Can't they hear the first time? Well, what's going on here? Just in case you guys are interested in knowing the spiritual side of this, right? Let me give you the spiritual side. When a person is, is, is trying to cast something away, and they say in the name of Jesus, the first time they speak it with just a vocal cords in their mouth. When they say it again and again and again, they're reminded of Christ Jesus. And then finally, when they speak it at a specific time, they're thinking about Christ. They need him. And with their minds and their hearts on Christ Jesus, then when they say it, they spoke it both of the mouth and of the spirit. And only then did they speak outside of hypocrisy. See, that word Jesus is just a word. If you have no association with it, because listen, if you look at language, don't get caught up on language because in Hebrew or in Aramaic Hebrew or in Kano Greek or in Greek, Jesus is not the name of the Messiah. Jesus is a translation. It is the way we pronounce it, but it was spoken differently back then. So how does it still work? You mean to tell me that you can take any word, translate it into any language, and it, it, it works no matter what it is? I can make up a language and have a name for Jesus that's not Jesus. How is it going to work? So I'm telling you right now, we're speaking vibrations out of our mouths. It's what's coming out of your spirit and soul that matters. Because if you speak something and it does not align with what's inside of you, you just spoke gibberish. When man repeats it over and over again, 
they're the ones that are reminded of Christ Jesus. See, because they may speak of the first time in a type of pride. They may speak of the second time, saying, "Uh uh-oh, I need some help. They may speak of the third time, saying, this person needs to be delivered. And then they start thinking about the Messiah. And when it gets at its height, when they're really thinking about the Messiah, then, whoop, there it is. I had a dream one time, and it felt like billions of demons were trying to, they were coming to get me to pull me down into darkness. It scared the peanuts out of my M&Ms, and I was sleeping. I couldn't move or do anything. And I remember saying, all I could think of was, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, and they kept coming. So I said it again, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, and then I was stopped. It's almost like everything stopped. It was a silence. I still couldn't move. I couldn't move anything. And it was almost like a communication came into me and said, you are not utilizing the name of the Messiah because you're not associating the Messiah with the vibrations coming out of you. See, in a dream, you're not speaking at all. You know that, don't you? In a dream, you're not speaking. It's all in the realm of thought. So how in the world can you rebuke something in the realm of thought without saying a word? This is for those who believe that you have to speak something. I beg to differ. When you speak, that's for your brothers and your sisters to hear. Demons can hear you on a different level. They know all about you because humanity is very loud. They never shut up. In this dream, this whatever it was, I was given what to say. And the key was this. Of what I was given, it was this. To take a stance against them in the name of Jesus, who is the only begotten Son of the living God, who died on the cross to save us of our sins. The one who ascended sits at the right hand of the Father. Now listen to me. When I rebuked that way, before I could ever speak it out, just thinking about that, when I was thinking about that, guess what happened? I heard screeches. I'm telling you, it felt like they were running away. All of a sudden, I sat up in the bed in peace. That was a horrible type of experience, but I sat straight up in the darkness in absolute and utter peace. And then I laid back down with a smile on my face because I was so thankful the Lord gave me that. And do you know what? Ever since that happened, I've been telling other people to do this and they have been doing it. And they find themselves not even being able to utter the whole thing before all of their night terrors have ended. I'm telling you right now in COT, I guarantee you we have over 10,000 emails, different people who have the exact same testimony. As soon as they identified the name with the Messiah on the cross, it stopped. They noticed changes in their home, in their animals, in their children. I'm one of those people, I can't overlook something like that. Somebody telling a demon you rebuke it in the name of Jesus 20 times like they didn't hear it the first, they heard exactly what you said the first time. But here's the key. When you speak from your vocal cords, that's for your brother and your sister to hear. Everything about you is purposed. But you also speak spiritually, which is why in the Bible it says, when you pray, sometimes moans and groans come out that only God can understand is your spirit communicating with the spirit of the living God and no one knows what you're saying. Sometimes your spirit will cry out to the living God and you won't understand what you're saying. Except for a few tears, that is speech. A communication is not limited to what you can say with your mouth. It has your intent involved in it. Now back to the initial question. I want you to see that to let you know something. You may not know your living spirit, but you are. And the spiritual side of you, that's the real side of you. Not your flesh. It's not what people see. It's not what you tattoo. It's not what's, you know, what is sick. It is not the part of you that could potentially have cancer. It's not the part of you that's been altered. It's not the part of you that is getting older. That's not the real you. That's a shell. That's a shell made for this earth that you can continue to be in the land of the living via that vessel because you have a purpose in your life. The real you is eternal. The real you never dies. Why do you think there's a hell? You don't die. You're going to transition from this place to another place, but you shall not die. You're not going to perish that way, not as men have defined death. You won't die that way. You will have an eternal existence in one place or the other. Whatever you side with, that's going to be your family. And you're making that decision right now. See, when you're gone, you can't make that decision. You're making a decision right now who your real family is. And this goes beyond any word you can speak. Now, let's get back to Jeremiah. Why in the world did his iniquities have to be cleared from him? This is the part we miss. As I said before in your life, most of the problems in your life have not been physical. They've been mental, but in truth, they've been spiritual. Supernatural assaults, supernatural resistance, supernatural timing. 
supernatural coordination against you. Isn't it funny how somebody else's situation can fall apart and they can easily correct it? But your situation is supernaturally planned. It hits at the wrong time when something else is taking place. At the exact time when you're, when you're at your lowest point, nothing ever happens in your life when you're ready for it. It always happens in your life when you're at your lowest. People normally, if they're Christians, they get sick at their lowest point, not their height. It takes them by surprise. They get sick at their lowest point when they're already going through something. See, you might want to know this. Satan will kick you when you're down. When you're upright and standing and you're ready to fight, you're not going to see him. No, he's going to wait until the other ones nip at you. And should you walk in disobedience in the slightest way, you don't even have to know it. They're going to wear you down and that's when he strikes in an attempt to get you not to believe in things of faith. So that the word you carry is not God's but yours. So that the gospel you carry is going to be altered. Because a lot of people read the gospel and then they'll say, well, this and what this actually means is. And the reason why they change it, the reason why they cannot have the New Testament defined by faith is because it's not working for them. And when it doesn't work for them, they'll say, well, it'll never work this way. So it must mean the alternative. That's how they do in this day and age. It must mean the alternative. I'll tell you right now, do not agree with any of that. I, I just don't. I do not go with the status quo. If too many people start believing in something, I'm telling you right now, I'm going in the opposite direction because Jesus already communicated to us the truth is not popular. People don't want the truth. People want their relaxation. They want their paradise. They want what they want. You know what I want? I want the will of God through the Messiah to become an absolute reality in people's lives because the Lord exposed me to another war that's not physical. Let me go over something else before I get to the meeting of this thing how many times in your life have you found out you were you were strong enough to withstand things right by way of your physical strength you had resources to take care of anything that fell apart many of you have experienced this something comes in no problem i've got the resources let's go ahead and take care of it but how many of you know you've had these issues that money could not fix strength could not alter couldn't do anything to it the only thing that could change the situation is you giving the right words. And how many people found themselves short of saying the right thing? And it, it almost killed you because you could not help the individual. Because you had nothing of value to really tell them. Because everything you would tell them, you already knew would be fake. It would just be simple encouragement. They needed something right then and there. And you spiritually did not have it and it left you powerless. How many people remember that in their lives? See, there are situations all the time that your strength cannot correct. But all the people in COT, we could come together. And by way of our physical strength and resources, we couldn't solve it. We couldn't fix it. See, there are some situations that can only be resolved spiritually. What about that person that has a mindset? They think that they're paranoid and they think that everybody is out to get them in this, that, and the other. And you're trying to tell them, no, that's in your mind, but they can't hear anything you're saying. What about that person that's severely depressed and you're trying to tell them how promising life is, but they won't hear a word you have to say. You can give them all the money in the world and they still won't listen to you. What about the individuals you're trying to keep from committing suicide and everything you tell them they give you the opposite strength is not going to fix it you can stop the person physically but as soon as you let them go you know they're going to try it again see your resources your money giving them a house whatever the case is it's not going to help them in that problem because they're seeing it very differently now in those cases guess what all the flesh in the world cannot fix that problem because that is spiritual i've seen people like that they've talked to every single psychiatrist out there they've seen the behavioral scientists nothing changed and then that's when you think in your mind the lord could give me something to say that would alter the course of their lives lord i need something to say i need you to give me something to say lord but guess what silence anybody ever go through that let me tell you something just in case you haven't that's something nobody desires to go through with but it certainly is something i went through with one day i found myself powerless and i needed knowledge from the lord and it did not come powerless that was the last time i went through that because you know what i did i said lord game time is over i see it prepare me spiritually and i begin to see the real war it is vast and it's always i'm not going to be left at any moment without anything from the father to give somebody else because see when it came down to it that's what they needed a word from the father they didn't need my words they didn't need some experts words they didn't need a financial fix right that's not what they needed they needed absolute clarity they needed spiritual hope and the only one that can give you that is the Most High through Christ Jesus by way of the Holy Spirit. So guess what? When you go out giving the Father's Word, 
if your words are anywhere in there, how can it be the Father's? And if it's not the Father's, it's not going to perform. God watches over his own word to perform it. You know what that means? That means every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, he will perform it. But if I taint it, if I alter this little piece over here and that little piece over there, if my emotion gets involved with it and it's altered and I get my two cents with the word, how can it be his word? It won't be performed. And if it's not performed, that means you receive an empty word. And when you receive an empty word, nothing happens. See, I found out a while ago, people don't need what I have to say. They really need the bread of life and the water of life. They don't need my word. They don't need me. They need the Lord's words because my words are going to fail. God's words are eternal. God had their iniquity passed from them because they were entering into a spiritual battle, something that not everybody could see. They were entering into a spiritual battle, and if they had gone out there full of iniquity, that same iniquity could have been used to stop them from telling the message. You ever speak to somebody about the Word of God, right? And you're not quite doing the right thing all the time, and, and then somebody says, well, aren't you the same one that is doing so-and-so? You ever have somebody that has dirt on you? You know what that is? If they have dirt on you, you, you better not utter anything about the living God because if you do, they're going to tell all about your dirt. Well, guess what? God causes that dirt to pass away from you. So Satan won't have anything on you. That's why you have to be within Christ Jesus. Because if you're not, Satan's got the scoop on you and he can destroy whatever you say. You guys see how that works? But if God causes your iniquity to pass away, how can the accusation stand? It cannot. And if you're in Christ Jesus and you repented, the accusation shall not stand. Stand, and God's word will be performed. And people, the ones who are appointed to hear, are going to hear. You've been sent here with a high purpose. See, we just have to learn that we can't get in the way. And when I say we, I mean our flesh and what we think and how we perceive things. Because oftentimes we assign ourselves missions. But the Lord has already given us a calling. And whom he called, he also qualified. And Satan can't do anything about it. See, he's been hiding this fact from a lot of people. How many times have you gone out there trying to throw something extra in because you thought somebody needed to hear it? And that's precisely what I'm talking about. Because in truth, that's what has been done. We'll say, well, I think so and so. They really need to know this, so let me tell them. Well, that's not God's word. That's coming from our minds. And if we are compromised in any way, that's no good. It's not going to have the desired effect. I see it every single day. When the Holy Spirit works within you for the sake of somebody else, you become a student yourself. Not only are you speaking to the other person, but you can hear what you're saying. You're saying, well, I would never dream that one up. There's also a bit of reverence in what you speak. It's almost like something is taking over. But with raw authority and with all faith, and there is no hesitation, and there is no waver, and there is no backing down, and the power, the presence of the Lord is in the conversation. And that's when things happen. If I were to go out there in the world with my own stuff, I'd be trampled to pieces. When the Lord sends you, he empowers you to complete whatever he sent you for. And in Jeremiah's case, Jeremiah, he was conditioned to do exactly what God wanted him to do. But make no mistake, Jeremiah had to pierce the spiritual realm to do what he did. And God prepared him to do that. He had the resistance of an entire nation against him. He had to endure things that nobody would endure that today. By himself, he could not endure what he endured for the sake of the word. He wouldn't have the mindset to do it. But with God, all things are possible. See, I'm always mindful that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's his gospel. And I'm very careful with it because it's his gospel, not mine. It's not some play toy. It's not something somebody should go in there and utilize it to smack somebody over the head or to get their way in a situation. That's not what it should be used for. And see, that is part of the spiritual battle. And just because you see somebody else doing it, please don't emulate that. Be authentic with the word of God. I still have a healthy fear of it. I know what will happen in my life if I ever betray it. I have knowledge of that. In fact, I have knowledge of quite a few things in my own life. And, most importantly, they were walking by faith, not by evidence. You can only walk by faith spiritually. Do you know that? You can't walk by faith carnally. It won't work. You'll always be scared off, backed up, pushed aside. You'll always give up. You'll say it's not worth it. But if you do it spiritually, then you put your whole life in the hands of Christ. When somebody is walking with the gospel of Jesus Christ spiritually, the one thing you'll never hear them do is complain about anything. You will never hear them complain about anything. Do you know why? Because there are no complaints in them. 
because they're already ready to give it all for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That means they're ready to give everything up for the sake of a word that's not theirs, but belongs to somebody else. That only happens by way of your love for one another. See, if you love each other enough, you're going to give the one you love the best of the best. You're not going to give them the leftovers. You're going to give them the best. And in this case, the words of Jesus are the best. And if you're willing, listen, when you really love your neighbor, you want them to have that word. You don't care what it takes. You don't care how many years you have to sit and eat crow. You want them to have the best. You're no longer interested in saving your own skin, but you devote your life for the sake of the gospel. That only happens by love. Because in that path of love is the only time we truly have patience. See, we need the truth of the gospel going out there because people need help. People don't need some, you know, what I think. That's not what they need. They need the truth, especially in the days that we're in right now. There's a spiritual war that the common man cannot see. He doesn't even comprehend the spiritual war. And people are losing. In the Bible, it talks about a remnant. Do you know that? At the end days, it talks about a remnant. Not that doesn't mean. That means that the greater half of the population will not make it. Think about that. They're not going to make it. And so these days that we're in right now, it calls for being authentic with the Word of God. Not playing games, because see, in the book of, of Ezekiel, they played games. They did things for the sake of wealth. Others did things just to get a date. That's a fact. They did things for many reasons. That those sickening things happened this day and age. A lot of people hurt themselves because they believe the world. The world teaches that there hardly is any spiritual thing you're going to have to encounter. That is a lie. The worst thing people are going to face, I'll say it again, I'll say this boldly, people are going to be sitting in the corner of their houses, frightened to move left or right to the point to where they may sit in a corner for weeks and starve to death. Their bones are going to be frozen, muscles frozen. They will be hungry, but they dare not move. That's how frightened they're going to be. Can you imagine a person sitting in the corner of their house because they're so frightened of spiritual things? They cannot move. Sitting there for weeks, no shower, no meal, no clean up, no nothing. So scared that they will not move for weeks in the corner of their own home. Now, that may sound funny right now, right? It's not going to be funny when it takes place. And it's going to take place when it looks like it will never take place. How many times does the Lord tell us that he comes as a thief? How many times does he have to tell us that he's coming at a time that no one's looking for him? You know what that means? All these days that are calculated, he's not coming on any of those days. He's not coming on any day we would know him to come in. No, that came from people. That came from mankind. That comes from people wanting hope in places, right? They're trying to extract something from the word of God to comfort their own selves. Well, I say this, let's complete our walk in Christ here on this earth, be authentic in all things, and we won't try to duck and dodge what will come, but we'll have faith to stand in all situations. Because for most of you, most of you right now, you're going through things right now. And some of you, are barely getting through. Some of these situations, these are the lesser situations, are consuming people. And if anything right now can make you give up, what do you think is going to happen when things are multiplied? When the spiritual manifestations begin? When the consummation of the times begins? Because once it truly begins where people begin to see it, it will not stop. You know what it says in the Bible? How it's going to be that a person will escape from the great noise outside, go into their homes, put their hand on the wall, and get bit by a snake. There's no escape from it. That's why God said only a, it is a, a fool will ask for the day of the Lord. That's what the Lord said. A fool will ask for it. He said there's no good in the day of the Lord for anybody. That's the true reason why Paul said, don't, don't, don't think as though the day of the Lord has already come. He, he was basically telling them, you, you better understand it has not come because you're not going to make a mistake and say, well, did the day of the Lord come or not? You won't make a mistake because it will be that intense and it will come from so many different directions. There's no rest in that day. Now, you know what the Lord told us? He said, number one, you're not appointed to his wrath. So you got to get your minds right. A lot of people say, well, you know, nothing is going to happen to me because I'm not appointed to his wrath. Things have already happened to you. Things have happened to just about everybody already, but they're purposed. While the world is laughing right now, you're going through things, aren't you? So don't try to emulate the world because people are going to have their time either before or after or during. Which one do you want? God is 
just and merciful. He gave you your days of trial spread out over a lifetime, lest you reject them. If you reject the trials that are coming into your life, if you continue to kick them to the curb and try to escape everything you get into, then your faith is not being tried. You're going to have to be here in a time that God doesn't want you. He didn't want you here when his wrath pours out. He didn't want you here when all these things come. And who would have to escape anything? The same one that's our Savior is the same one that opens the seals. Why would a person have to escape? Even that scripture in the Bible was when it says, pray that you escape all these things and to stand before the sun. Pray that you're worthy to escape all these things. Go look that up in the Kano Greek, that word escape, and see what you see. You're not going to see the word escape. You're going to see something else. That's a translation. And people use that to say, well, I'm praying I'm worthy. Well, let me tell you what's going to make a person worthy to escape all those things at the end. That means they went through all of them before it ever happened. To be worthy to stand before the Son of Man means you're worthy. That means you're washed by the blood of the Lamb, first of all. That means you have repented. And how many of you know you can't repent of anything unless the Lord tell you where you have error? And did you find out that over the course of time, God will bring, He will tell you where you're messing up. You repent of new things just about every single week because the Lord will have you in a discovery mode. He didn't give you all of it at once. You repent of those things you know, but then it happens. You start finding out, wait a minute, I've been messing up in this area. Thank you, Lord, for showing me that. Let me turn away from that. And then he shows us something else. Well, I've been messing up in this area. Well, I thought this was the truth, and it wasn't. Lord, forgive me for spreading that one. You're finding these things out over time. It is the Messiah who is disclosing these errors to you. He's doing it now. So all those who are trying to get out of every problem they've ever had, and they're not utilizing the ways of faith. They're doing themselves a disservice. See, all those people who did not repent, who did not choose Christ, or who fell away, they're going to be tried. But they're going to be tried in the time of torment. They're going to be tried in a time where no man is purposed to ever go through. They're going to see all the horrors, and a lot of people won't. Now, you can be tried now, or you can be tried then. But either way, you're going to be tried. And to be worthy to stand before the Son of Man means you have committed in your heart to serve the Lord anyway, to love the Lord anyway. So guess what? Those who are worthy to escape all things are the same ones who are not trying to escape, but they have committed to th themselves to finish their race, to endure until the end. They've already made it up in their minds. I am going to endure this until the end, until the Lord calls me home. I'll serve him every day of my life. I'll get better and better. And it doesn't matter if you, if you messed up here and there. Stop thinking somehow you're condemned. If you were ever condemned to the point where God did not want you, it would be impossible for you to have faith in Christ. Jesus. That's when you know you're condemned. That's what's in the Bible. Because those who are truly condemned, those who are given over to a reprobate mind, they no longer have faith in Christ Jesus. So long as you have faith in Christ, so long as you believe that he is the only begotten son of the living God, so long as you believe that he died on the cross and was raised from the dead, that he sits at the right hand of the Father, that he indeed did what he did for the remission of sins. So long as you believe that, you better remember something. You don't believe that on your own. God put that belief in you that's a seal upon you right now if you were ever condemned you would no longer believe it you would no longer have faith in christ you would no longer believe in the cross that is clear in the bible what you go through what you are exposed to you know what that is that's you being made worthy for what though to be a citizen of the kingdom of god to be a permanent citizen of the kingdom of god to be named a child of the most high to be a joint heir with christ to be like he is now do you see god prepared these people to carry his word that it would not be tainted he caused their iniquity to pass away he filled them with the holy spirit because it is a spiritual battle to carry the word of god and that's why you face spiritual opposition when you have a strong heart toward the gospel of jesus christ but you have a responsibility to always ensure listen you can trust the messiah you never have to make up anything on your own the lord knows what he's doing in other people's lives too see other people are going through a process just like you are you didn't change overnight you changed over time and you're still changing. Understand that about those you're being sent to. They're not going to change overnight. But every little piece of the truth that gets to them, it matters. And if you've been selected 
to carry a portion of that truth to somebody else, then you have an honored, an honored service to fulfill. Never alter it. Because if you alter it, what you're actually saying is, well, I think that what God has given, well, it's just not going to do the job. That's not expressing faith in the Messiah. Trust the guidance of the Lord. So you have to learn to trust him more than you. You have to learn to trust him more than the fear that could be still with you. That means some reversals have to take place in our lives. Because in truth, we have carried the message of the world mixed with the gospel to these people. The same thing that happened last time. Did you notice something in the word of God that most of the experts, the people who were appointed to high positions, they were the very ones who did not have his word. The ones who thought they knew it all, they were the ones that did not have his word. They knew what he said, but they did not have his word. They became spiritually dead. They began to alter the word, to replace things in the word, because they had no faith themselves. Do you know that's also mentioned in the New Testament? It's mentioned to happen again, that they would do it again, because they had no faith in it, because it didn't work out for them. They would change places in the word of God to suit their own paradigm and what they actually believe. That's happening all over the world. And if it continues to happen, it won't require faith to be a Christian. I'm telling you what I know. I mean, when I say be a Christian, I mean named by men or women to be a Christian. But we all know what Jesus said to the seven churches. He gave warnings, didn't he? Strengthen those things that are ready to die. Watch, he said, because there was a large group of people that refused to watch. Why? Because they were living it up in the world. If you watch, what are you actually doing, everybody? If you watch, just like Jesus said to watch, first of all, what are you watching for? You're watching for all things Jesus. That's what you're watching for. So if you're watching, then you're also prepared for him to come back. If you're prepared for him to come back, you've left nothing undone. You didn't sit there and say, well, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll forgive that person another day. I just don't want to think about it today. That's not going to help your situation. Those who truly watch are prepared right now for the arrival of Christ. You know what that means? It, it does not mean that they're perfected. It means they have done everything they know how to do. It means they have been responsible with the word God gave them to understand. See, he didn't give us the whole entirety of the word because we would never achieve what it requires. We're operating within a gift given to us, sustained by grace. Mercy keeps it going. And God has given us the truth in part. See, it's that part we have to be a good steward over. Not of what we don't know. A lot of people say, well, what you don't know, you know, what you don't know. See, well, when you're talking spiritually, if you really don't know it, the Lord has you for it. He's got you. Anything you have not covered, he has. But see, he's given us all the responsibility. He's given us understanding of a portion of his word. And in that portion of the word that you do understand, you're going to be accountable for keeping that portion of the word. There is no excuse for us for what we do understand. That's why he said much known, much required. Because if you're one of those who truly knows a lot, right? A person who, who really does know a lot about the word of God. I've noticed something about those in truth. I've seen people do it. They, they quote things. That's not what I'm talking about. People who quote things, that doesn't mean they know it. People who actually know it, they're very quiet and silent. I cannot jump in with the stuff of the world and agree with him on issues because I do not. When you're exposed to the spiritual realm, you wouldn't either. You'll know that this realm of flesh and all of what it entails is a big farce. It's a waste of time. It's necessary for your occupation here, but that's just about it. It holds no great meaning and no great mystery. But all the wealth of your life is going to be bound in the spiritual realm itself. And when you're exposed to it, you see the conditions of the war. And to be frank with you, this war is ugly. See, when a person is ready for that, God will give you eyes to see who is who beyond their flesh. You will not see people by their flesh another day. You think scientists can explain that? You may think I'm nuts, but I don't see people like most people do. I don't even hear them like most people. In my actual hearing, I hear something else. In my actual sight, I see something else. I can't deny it. It's just the way I see and hear things. It'd be like you looking out at a bunch of babies crying. And the louder the cry, the worse the offenses that men perceive. But they're not offensive to me. I could see somebody go and rob a bank or do whatever. That's that's not offensive to me. You know why? Because it's a cry. You have some good kids, honorable vessels, and some bad kids, dishonorable vessels. But you know that. All of them are looking for love itself. And the most dangerous people in the world will tell you that they're dangerous because they receive no love. But they receive love from dark places and they sign it with it. 
This is part of the battle. Only God knows the absolutes of who is who. We do not. So God knows who's worthy to be fought for and who is not. God knows that. If a person is walking around on this earth, God knows exactly if this person's not going to be with him or will. We do not. Therefore, we love all. We don't make that distinction. We have hope for all. Do you see how that works? Because in truth, God did not give that to us, did he? He already told us he did not give that to us. But that he knows it, not us. Why do you think he said, love your enemies? My goodness, there it is right there, summed up. He would have never said that. God doesn't contradict himself, not ever. We do. We contradict ourselves. We want the spiritual wealth to manifest in this physical realm, but we often deny the spiritual truth because of this realm. But now is time to stand up spiritually, which is to say, not just to get up on your feet in the physical body, but to stand up by way of your faith and go forward in what the Lord has given you. No one is the expert in your life. Your father is. I'm not. Nobody else is either. Your father is. Don't fear anything that anybody can do to your flesh, but give all respect to the Most High. And when you're ready, if you're saying to yourselves, well, well, I've not seen any spiritual war, when you're ready, the Lord will open your eyes in proportion to what you're truly ready for. And he knows what you're truly ready for. You know how people say, you got to be careful what you ask God for. No, you don't. That's foolishness. You do not have to be careful what you ask God for. God is a sovereign and good father. He's not going to give a child who's too young a knife that will cut his hand off. He's not going to do that. That's earthly stuff that we do. These are clever sayings that people have come up with to have conversation, to get a laugh or chuckle here or there. Why would a good father give any child a gift that would kill him. He's not going to do that. These earthly, worldly sayings have crept into the body of Christ and have absolutely choked it. It's like academia to me. People really trust in academia. You know what? The smartest people in this world, what are they really smart at doing? Playing with toys that men have created. That's what they're smart at. You go to college for 20 years. What do you learn about? You learn how somebody else made something and you learn everything about it. That's what you learn. And if you learn something authentic, like how the body works, that is so often perverted and distorted to the max. It's, it's just they take a good thing that could be good. They turn it to iniquity because doctors fight to give you prescriptions for the kickbacks they get in pharmaceutical products. The whole thing is rigged. But there's one kingdom that man cannot pollute. And we all know what that kingdom is. And that kingdom shall come. And the will of the one who sits on the throne of that kingdom, his will shall be done in this earth, just like in the heavens. All of what you see in this world and all of what you deal with, it will pass away. But the word of God will not. That's the eternal place and part of the eternal realm. You've been given a first class ticket to be a citizen of that eternal place and eternal realm. To be a joint heir with Christ himself. And that's something. And Satan cannot take that away from you. All Satan can do is cause you to believe what you see with your eyes. Well, Satan, through his little, the dragon is what it's called. That's actually a system composed of many different entities. The dragon is aware of all of what we do because we operate in kingdoms of the dragon already. And we have been. Listen, if it's not God's kingdom, what is it? If it's not God's kingdom, you're operating in the kingdom of who? The prince of the power of the air. Just like in the Bible it says... Uh, the prince of the power of the air works in the children of disobedience. So if you're not obedient, Satan is working in you, through you, and all in all sorts of ways. But if you are obedient, you're not under his influence. You're not fulfilling his will. To fulfill the will of Satan is to be outside the will of God. Does he need to hear you audibly? Who do you think has responsibility in language? And does anybody know what the American language truly is? Does anybody know what, what it truly is? Does anybody know how the, how the German language actually came about? You may not know this, but the English language is a combination of a few languages and incantations. These kingdoms are tricky, and you may not know this, but half the words we use in the English language are in fact part of rituals and incantations, spells, and other things, just so you know. The world is encompassed with and saturated with a bunch of lies, keeping people spiritually dead, fighting directly against their faith, because their agendas, these spiritual agendas that you think are so complicated, they are quite simple. They want you destroyed, and they want to use you to occupy your place. They want this place to be unredeemable. You gotta ask yourself, why in the world will Satan continue doing the dumb things he's doing when he knows he's on death row? Who would do that? If you knew you were gonna be condemned at the end, why continue in the first place? You'd have to be an absolute idiot to do that, right? If you knew you were about to be condemned, why in the world would you continue? There's got to be a plan involved, and there is. 
The plan is quite clear. The problem is people have seen too much media, too much television, too much, too many movies. And so when you start getting close to real answers spiritually, all these interruptions flood in and your mind gets fogged up. It just gets all bogged up. So it's, it's very difficult to come up with a, any tangible real answer that makes any type of spiritual cohesive sense because of media. Media is highly purposed. Entertainment is important. It's important because it keeps people kind of tranquilized, tranquilized against you waking up to absolute faith. But it won't last long because you live in the days of manifestation and there are going to be people who are playing around with their faith. They're going to go through a horror period. For many, it's already started. For some, they have been enduring it for a long time. And it's not going to be pretty. All the good stuff we've ever invented has been turned into a, a, a weapon or a defense strategy or something has happened to where it fell into the hands of military industrial complex. It's going to be used for aggression, which is why I like this statement in the Bible when it says they'll learn war no more. I like that statement because I hate war. And once you've been in combat uh, 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 too many times, you, you wouldn't like it either. It becomes war stupid. It's full of, it's very stupid. I say, that's the only word I have for it. It's stupid. It's wasteful. And it really shows like two kids fighting over a pencil. They talk, but if the conversation does not work, they start throwing blows to injure each other. Why? Because they're not willing to listen to each other. They're not willing to compromise, and both of them think they should have ownership of the pencil. So we have two vessels of pride that will not give in, back down, or have mercy towards the other one. War comes about every single time. It's probably why the U.S. is involved in over 160-plus conflicts right now. 